Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In this clip, uh, the, there are some people that still are so woefully misinformed about this case and still emotionally attached to it that they can't seem to grasp the reality of the facts of the case. So I wanted to show this clip and talk about it. School records, do you think that it's fair to be looking into his background to that extent when he's not here to defend himself? And did the judge make the right call here? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, you have to look at that because what we don't know is we don't have video of what actually led to the shooting. And obviously George Zimmerman was assaulted. He had a broken nose and the back of his head was cut from hitting the ground. He had grass stains on him. Yeah, and he hitting the ground because Trevon was banging his head. Trayvon Martin didn't have any wounds of any kind on him other than the knuckles from punching Zimmerman. So looking at his behavior, we might be able to see what led up to this. If Trayvon Martin had an explosive personality where, you know, he got... That would be icing on the cake, but it certainly wouldn't make a bit of difference in this case. I mean, whether or not a guy was violent in the past, the fact that he is violent this time is what matters. And the fact that George had the, the injuries and the fact that Trevon was on seen on top of him is enough for an for a reasonable person to conclude that George was defending himself. Got angry and he punched somebody or got angry and shoved somebody and that was something he did commonly then it's probably what led to the eventual shooting in this matter. And you know like I said it could be but again it doesn't matter the facts are we have the evidence that Trevon was on top of George. We have the evidence that George was banged up pretty severely. And the people that argued that George should be thrown in jail don't really care for the facts. So you could sit here and argue this all day with them, and they're just going to go around and around and around. At first they said, oh, he has no injuries. And we even had uh, Attorney Crump saying, oh, there, there were no injuries. It's ridiculous. But he knew. He had the pictures. He had seen the pictures of the bloody skull. And the fact that he lied about that on, on TV to the American public means that he very well could be um, held responsible, at the very least be disbarred. When you say the victim in this case, the victim of the shooting is Trayvon Martin. It doesn't mean that George Zimmerman, Zimmerman was not a victim of an assault, and that assault led to George Zimmerman defending himself using it. I would agree partially, and that is that George absolutely was the victim because he was the one that was being pummeled, and he was the one that was uh, trying to get free and couldn't be free. As much as he wanted to be free, he couldn't. So that means he's the victim. And, and I've said this in other videos. I mean, if you have a woman who's being raped, she's the victim, right? Now, if she happens to pull a, a gun out of her purse and shoot the guy that's raping her, does he become the victim? Is he considered the gunshot victim now? No. He is the perpetrator. She is the victim. That never changes in a crime. Once one person is the perpetrator and the other person is the victim, it doesn't switch when the, when the victim uses deadly force and protects their life. This is completely and absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the fact is that we know that Zimmerman started this. He is the, the aggressor in this. There is actually audio of yeah, this. There so there's audio a, there's of an assault? A audio of their interaction, you hear. So right there, he's saying there's audio of the fact that George uh, attacked Tra Travon, which is totally false. I mean, does this guy have any clue? Has he even listened to the tapes? You got to wonder sometimes when you listen to these talking heads on TV whether they have any clue about the, the case because, I mean, even the people that comment on my videos here, the ones that leave a lot of comments, typically they're pretty informed about the case and they've come to the conclusion that George is the bad guy no matter what. So you can bring out all the evidence you want. They'll understand the evidence. They might even agree that, you know, it makes... Trevon looked bad, but at no time will they ever change their mind. So, you know, that's not going to happen, ever. So. For him talking to the police, he made the four. Yes, made the we have a timeline. Yes, at ahead. the time that he spoke to the police, 
there's no indication at all that Trayvon had any idea that he was alive, that he had anything to do with them. Zimmerman was then told to back off. You don't need Why to do yeah, And that's not exactly true because we know that when George drove by Trayvon and Trayvon was up in the yards between the houses and they made eye contact and George drove on around past Trayvon Trevon followed George, and so George pulled into the parking area in front of the clubhouse. And we've shown all that in the in the the video that I made on the timeline. So if you type in Poker Face Todd timeline, you'll you'll see the map. You'll see my explanation of how it, how it coincides with the call. You can actually hear the call, and we discuss it. So we know from that point, George pulls into the parking area. And Trevon comes and walks around the truck at that time. And there's about a 45-second period where Trevon is walking around the truck or looking at George. And at one point, we can actually hear a third voice. And some people can't hear it. I certainly can hear it. It's right around the time where the dispatcher tells George not to lose sight of Trevon. Keep an eye on him. Follow him around and don't let him get out of your sight. Now, some people are going to say he never said to follow him around and make sure he never got out of his sight. Well, I'm going to disagree. I'm going to tell you he did say, let us know if he does anything else. He says it more than once. Let us know if he does anything else. That is a command to keep an eye on somebody, no matter where they go, no matter what they do. Keep an eye on them by telling us, let us know if he does anything else. That's all he needed to do. So when George lost sight of him as he went around the building, George moved his car. And as he moved his car, he he didn't regain sight of him again until the point where he was pulling his car into the place by the T. And if you look at the video, you'll see that. And he gets out of his car and tells the dispatcher which direction Trevon's going, which is towards the south or towards the back entrance. So we know that information, that Trevon is at least 150 feet in front of George when Trevon disappears into the darkness, which meant that he had a very large head start. He could have been halfway to his house by the time George got to the dark T in the sidewalk. But these guys don't recognize this or they don't want to, they don't want to focus on that information. Dispatcher. By the dispatcher. Right. The police who he called. It's not this, a police officer. Well, it's a dispatcher. I know. It's a police employee. You don't need to do that. Or right. we don't exactly. need you to do that. Exactly. That we don't need you to do that. It doesn't, that's not. Okay. It's, okay. Uh, there's no see. need. Let's, there's let's, no let's, need. There's no need to do it. Beyond that, J Zimmerman has extremely serious psychological issues that prevented him from being a police officer. He's a t typical wannabe cop. See, that, that right there, I would think, would be... Uh, something that George could sue somebody for because number one I know that there is no evidence that George has any psychological issues so I know that he that uh, he has what a lot of people have which is ADHD is a little bit he has a little bit of a problem with with short-term memory it certainly wouldn't preclude him from being a police officer and I don't know of any time that he was denied the uh, ability to be I, I don't think he ever applied but if he did I would like to see that evidence and then you know if that's not true this guy should be very careful what he says he's, he knows he's carrying a gun yeah. carrying a gun gives you a certain amount of bravado he is dealing with a child somebody Tim who's actually a had a name for that of the holster, person, a holster sniffer yeah, yeah well I, I call him a wannabe okay so he again he says a wannabe as if he's he wants to be a cop where I don't believe that's the testimony. A holster sniffer. Yeah. yeah well, I I call him a wannabe. Okay. So he he is a he is a he is dealing with a child, a minor under the law. He is the aggressor. He did not wait, sit back, and and have uh, Trayvon Martin come and approach him. And there's another point that I want to point out before I go on, and that is he. They keep saying he's the aggressor. The, the people on the on the left, which is this guy's on the right, but I'm saying the people who don't like guns generally are the ones that bring this up. Florida state law says that even an aggressor gets to use the stand-your-ground law or the immunity defense if 
they after starting a fight let's say there was evidence that somebody starts a fight and then in the middle of the fight they decide they want to stop they want to get out of the fight as they and they make that clear i want out like say for example they're yelling for help 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 does that mean that they want to stop the fight yes it does so if you look into the immunity law and we've already discussed that and you can go back through my videos and find out where I talk about stand your ground you'll see that it's very clearly covers the the aggressor if he decides that he wants to get out of the fight but these guys just don't want to acknowledge that either that or they're just so clueless that they they you know they haven't studied it at all or they're not interested in studying it they just have their beliefs sit back and, and have uh, Trayvon Martin come and approach him. He obviously got out of his vehicle and approached Trayvon Martin. All these things. Actually, the evidence shows, and if you watch my timeline video, you'll see Trayvon came back and approached George. So he keeps saying that George approached Trayvon, but there is no evidence of that. The fact he got out of his truck and walked down onto the sidewalk doesn't mean that he approached Trevon. That means that he was trying to get an eyeball on the direction Trevon went. That's all it means. And for anybody to prove otherwise, you would have to you'd have to show the evidence. You'd maybe a a witness that said I saw this or I saw that. But we don't have that right now. All we have is the witnesses that support George's story. Exactly. Put him in the aggressor seat. You cannot start a fight with somebody and then wait, 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 say, start a fight and, and then claim that it's in self defense and there he is he's just totally wrong obviously he doesn't have a clue about the law the law says that you can be the aggressor you can start the fight you can be pounding on somebody and then they get the upper hand and you say listen i'm done i give up i give up and if they refuse or if you're saying you're calling out for help and they're refusing to let you go they're holding you down and they're physically assaulting you and you're afraid for your life, well then, guess what? You have that, the law protects you. You get to walk away scot-free, even though you started the fight. Clearly he did. He, first of all, the bias, saying that he sees a black kid in this neighborhood. No, 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 that's the bias. So now he's going to suggest that because the media twisted it and made it that it, he was looking for a black kid, that that proves that he was biased and that he was the aggressor because of that. This is how they're going to he's trying to suggest the proof that George is the aggressor. Obviously, the guy is a terrible advocate for the Travenites. You would think he they would find somebody that's a little more clued in on the facts. As of NBC, that's no. not the bias. He did not say that. The dispatcher asked him, is he black, white, or what? Okay. He said, I think he's black. Okay, so I think so that's bias. Right. So no, that's no, it is. NBC his thought, bias. Absolutely not. He, yes. he thought he was black. This is one of the reasons why he called it in. He wouldn't. Why would he call it in if he just saw, he saw a guy with kid. a hoodie lurking and underneath the eaves of a, of a townhouse so moving really in the rain. rain. That was his rain. You really don't really think he was concerned. Why did he call it in? The guy's up close to the houses. He's wearing a hoodie, and he's a black teen. Even if there wasn't evidence that there was a bunch of black, black kids breaking into houses in the neighborhood, it still is suspicious, and, even, and more so when it's a teenager, and even more so, unfortunately, for the black kids because that's the majority of people that are breaking into houses right now, and especially in that area. They're just... It's obvious there's a whole bunch of break-ins and they're all young black men. What are you supposed to say? Oh, we can't we can't even look at them. We can't even we can't call the cops on them because it might be considered racist. What a ridiculous argument. Extra concern because this was a black man wearing a hoodie in his neighborhood. He might have been, and it might be totally justified. Don't uh, don't assume that any looking at a race is racism. It's not because if the perpetrators in that community, and there had been many many burglaries, and if ninety percent of the perpetrators were black, it would be reasonable that an eighty-three year old white woman walking down the street probably isn't the threat that a, a young black man wearing a hoodie moving. But the eighty-three-year-old white woman could have been the lookout for for the bad guys. It's possible, but it's not <laughs> probable. <laughs> And this is the typical argument that we hear on the YouTube comments, the typical person who supports Trayvon, you know, making the argument that, yes, the 83-year-old lady could be a, a lookout for, 
for the bad guys. Yeah, but the possibilities are like slim to none. That's why when people look out their window and they see an 83-year-old woman walking down the street, they're not as nervous as they are when they see a teenager, especially a teenager that's looking around because teenagers have a different outlook on life. They have a different understanding of time. And as you get older, you start to realize. But there's this certain sec segment of our society that thinks we should not look at that. They want to, to look at the skin color for certain things, like, say, for example, benefits for school, you know, getting in, you know, getting ahead, even though your grades might be lower, getting, getting into the best colleges or something like that. For those reasons, they want us to look at skin color. But when it comes to the negative things, like when we, we know that it's that there's a lot of black people that are causing a lot of of issues in this in a certain community, we, we shouldn't look at that and and be on the watch for people that look that way. I mean, we're either going to be a colorblind society or not. But one thing that can never be legislated is the ability for people individuals to make a uh, preconception people will always preconceive they will always look out and say that person looks like he's more of a danger to me that person over there looks like less of a danger and that's always going to be that way each person has the power to affect those around them by changing their appearance if you if you want to look like a a big tough guy a thug and wear your pants down to your butt and have tattoos all over your arms and on your neck and stuff, that's fine. But you you know, as an individual, no, one's, no one has to tell you. You find out for yourself that society will be prejudiced against you. So you have to earn your place in society a lot. It's much more difficult. That's why I see these guys that have these tattoos that, can't be covered up by their shirts and stuff and I wonder you know what were they thinking because when it's time to get a job or something you know they're being their person as this is what they want to do and most of them are perfectly good people the problem is there's a whole bunch of bad guys that also wear tattoos I mean if you go to a prison they're just full of guys with tattoos so you know if you don't if you have the option not to look like a criminal try not to and then you hear the Black people, well, you know, hey, I'm black. What am I supposed to do? I can't take that color off. I'm not telling you to, and I don't think anyone should because there's a whole bunch of very good, nice black people in the world and a lot of bad white people. So I certainly don't suggest that black or white is good or bad. I'm just saying when you see black teenagers walking down the street, you have to have a little more concern. And if you think that that means that I'm racist, well, just type into YouTube some sort of search. You pick the words and try to find out if you can figure out which group of teenagers are more dangerous. I mean, if you're just walking down the street, who's going to beat you up just if you're just passing by for no, you know, unprovoked? In some cases, not even a robbery attempt. Just like uh, I saw the video and I recorded, I uh, talked about one where these teenagers were walking by a teacher and one of them just decided to reach over and cold cock this guy and knock him to the concrete and he hit his head hard. I mean, it probably knocked him out before he hit the concrete. It certainly could have been a deadly blow and, and the kid was probably maybe 16. He was more, I think, maybe three or four inches shorter than Trevon and 20 pounds lighter. That's why I recorded it. I wanted to prove that people keep saying that Trevon was a child, just a little baby, but we can see what little babies can do with one blow, one smack, especially if it's a sucker punch, because if you don't see it coming, it can do a lot of damage. But it's not based in it's, fact or it, reality. And it is not based in fact or reality that Trayvon Martin was trespassing or he was going to commit a crime. And that's was, what, that is the f thought that formed inside no, it, of Actually... The thought that Trevon was, you know, in a neighborhood that he didn't belong was based in, in reasonable suspicion because George had been there for years and 
had not seen Trevon there. So that was reasonable suspicion. That was number one. Number two, he was up in between yards, uh, especially in a house that was not occupied at the time and that had been robbed just in the very recent past. A lot of people say that it's a cut through. It's not really the cut through unless you're going south from that point. Because if you're really going to use the cut through, you would have gone through the other the other side of that same building on the on the north end of that building because that would have been the true cut through. So he was either thinking about breaking into that house or he was thinking about going south and decided to follow George instead of going south, which would have been exactly the same distance or actually quicker from where he was to go home if he had gone south around the lake on the on the bottom side. So the positioning puts him in a in a position of possible criminal activity. He's standing between houses in a yard. It's not his. He doesn't look like he belongs in the neighborhood. He's got a hoodie on and he's eyeballing George like what in the hell are you looking at kind of attitude. And then he starts following George trying to intimidate George. And we know he tries to intimidate George because George tells us while he's on the phone to the dispatcher, he tells the dispatcher he's putting his hands in his waistband, which is an intimidating move. And we all, all know that's what that's what young black guys do when they're trying to intimidate each other. I personally believe he may have had a gun and he went and hit it, maybe even took it home. I'm not sure what he did with it, but I have a feeling he did because it's not very wise to pretend like you have a gun you know, putting your hand in your waistband when the other guy might have a gun and shoot you, just say, I'm going to take this guy out before he gets a chance, and then I'm going to take off. So we know Trevon was menacing George for at least 45 seconds in that parking lot, and then he disappears around the building. He goes over by the mailboxes, and then George moves around to park over by the T, and as he's driving around that corner, he, George, Trevon can see him very clearly. They're face to face almost but George can't see him because his headlights are facing forward you can see it in my uh, video the uh, timeline video it's a reasonable okay, so, no, so, not wait, so make a good it point. is not he's yeah. not trained at all how do you know it's reasonable it's the very man, reasonable it isn't yet yeah, in your law enforcement trained mind it is but he is so <laughs> the guy at least admits that the person he's arguing with is law enforcement trained and he's saying it is reasonable suspicion all those things that we just talked about, that those are all reasonable. And he's saying, yeah, in your law enforcement trained mind, but not in George's mind. Well, he just got done saying that George is supposedly a wannabe police officer. You think he's got a little clue about what would be suspicious in the mind of the police officer? In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the police officers came and gave him a whole list of things that would be considered suspicious. And told him what to be on the watch for in the neighborhood. Not a law enforcement officer. He had no. He right knows to his do neighborhood. He no, his he neighborhood didn't. Watch. He clearly, he didn't. Well, clearly, he didn't, didn't live there. Jim, he was visiting. Jim makes know, an interesting point there. about his background. That he said that um, there's no evidence that he was, um, you know, hostile or that he was coming there to commit a crime. So therefore. Uh, Jim, do you think it's okay to look into his background to see if he's the kind of kid that was committing crimes? And she clearly does not want them to be able to look into his background. But what she doesn't realize is before we're going to put a man away for life for a crime that he didn't commit because he was on the ground getting his head bashed into the ground and his face busted up, and he finally, after calling out for help for a long time and nobody coming to his aid, finally used the only way he could to get out of it before he was knocked cold. And everybody's saying, oh, well, he wasn't that close to being knocked cold. He got up and walked away. Well, you know what? That's what happens. You either get knocked out or you don't. If you don't get knocked out, you can get up and walk away. If you do get knocked out, you can't get up and walk away. That's how it works. It's just an amazing thing, you know? You're engaging in um, antisocial kind of activity. I think it's typically the kind of thing that a defense attorney would do to try in a desperate attempt to dirty up the victim in order to help get his client off. <laughs> Of course, that's the way he's going to feel about it. It just makes the case so much easier to prove to the judge or to a jury, if, if it ever has to go that far, that indeed Trevon was likely to be pounding on George for no apparent reason because that's what he does. He's 
he, that's you know that's his thing. He doesn't like it when people trespass onto his uh, perceived turf. He seems to think that you know if you're walking behind him, that somehow or another uh, you're taking away his rights, which is absolutely untrue. What he should have done, and what I had done in the past when I was his age, is confront the person uh, in a gentlemanly fashion, tell him my name, and ask him what it is that he that he needed, if there's anything I could do for him, and that that would resolve it. Hey, my name's Trevon. I'm staying with my dad. I noticed you're following me. You, are you neighborhood watch or something? Is you concerned about me? I live right down here. You can come on down and meet my parents if you like. But the options are not, let's beat this guy senseless, even after he's crying out for help for 40 seconds, even after one of the neighbors come out and say to stop. No, that's not one of the options. Sorry. And this is something that the media and all these people should be teaching these kids instead of telling them that Trevon was the victim. All it does is build up their feelings that they have the same right and that in some cases, they're hoping that somebody will kill them so that they can be as famous as Trevon. You've heard of the copyca copycat cases where people do similar things just so that they can be renowned or infamous. So anyhow, good talking to you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.